Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, in this video, we're talking about counterpunchers, not lead punchers. So we're not talking about current champion Leo Santa Cruz or contenders James Kirkland or Alfredo Angulo. Nor are we talking about former champions like Rocky Marciano or Antonio Margarito. Those guys are all lead punchers. Rather, this video is on how to beat a counter puncher, right? Guys like Juan Manuel Marquez, Floyd Mayweather, Erislandi Lara, Anthony Mundine, Sergio Martinez, James DeGale, Andre Ward, Carl Frotch, Bernard Hopkins, both Klitschko brothers, right? Counterpunchers are making their presence felt in the sport right now and have for decades. Now, let me offer a disclaimer. I'm not a boxing trainer, nor have I ever been one. I'm simply a hack online who from time to time gabbles on the sport and who is looking for an edge on the casino. This is not a view from ringside, but from a sports book. Now, counterpunchers, as I like to say, are the safe crackers of the sport. They're looking for patterns to counter. The whole thing keys off of pattern recognition. So they will see you with the left hand low and they'll make a note of it so that later when your left hand is again low, they'll throw a right hand over it. They'll see that you are slow to pull back a jab and they'll make a note of it so that later when your hand is extended they'll time it so that they can throw a punch behind it. They will see you move to the left as they throw a right hand and they will eventually throw that right hand to the left not where you are but where you will be. They see you dip your head at certain times on certain punches or at certain moments in combinations. And they'll time it so later when you do that again, when the pattern holds, they will throw an uppercut at precisely the moment that you dip your head. They often jab. They operate on rhythm. You'll see them keeping rhythm in the ring. Sergio Martinez bobbing his upper body. Fighters who will swing an arm even when they are standing still. Many keep rhythm off of their jab. Think Vladimir Klitschko for example. In fact I believe for many they're reading rhythm more than they're reading punches. Once they have figured out your rhythm, they will drop their hands to conserve energy. Forget what you've heard. You know the right way to box. They say protect yourself at all times. Keep your hands up. That's not what Eris Landy Lara is doing. That's not what Floyd Mayweather is doing. That's certainly not what Sergio Martinez is doing. These guys figure out the pattern. They understand that keeping their hands up drains energy. So they'll drop their hands, right? Because they figured out your pattern, when you can hit them, at what angles. And they'll drop their hands when they think they're too far away to get hit. The good ones defensively are full body. Their defense is not a raised arm, even though this helps. Rather, it is positioning of their entire body. 
So you'll notice Floyd Mayweather up on the ropes has his hands like this and he'll lean away. They lean with punches. Everslandy Lara, middle of the ring. He's leaning away. Right? These guys literally have defensed the punch before it's thrown. Let me name some specific fights. Look at James DeGale's last fight against Dinah Davis. Look at Erislandy Lara's fight against Austin Trout. Right now, Davis and Trout have fast hands, but DeGale and Lara are able to drop their hands. This is against fast opponents, opponents with jabs. Right? The Gale's defense and Lara's defense consists of angles and spacing. They will turn away from an opponent knowing that the opponent can't hit them in the back of the head. The part of the body where the opponent can hit them, they'll know is too far away for the opponent to hit them with a jab, and they'll be ready to roll away from the other hand that the opponent has. Right? As I've said before in this video, the defense is set up before the punches are thrown. They will see that an opponent is not in a position to throw an uppercut, and they will lean in. Because they are reading you, they tend to be what I call adaptive reactive. They can adapt. They can change as a fight goes forward. They also set traps to exploit your patterns. Juan Manuel Marquez knew that Manny Pacquiao would try to come in with the left hand as he was by the ropes. Of course, we know Marquez was not by the ropes by accident. He's by the ropes because it's a trap. He let Manny Pacquiao walk right into his right hand. It ended the fight. It ended their series. Sergio Martinez knew that Paul Williams, like Pacquiao, was too aggressive and dropped his right as he came forward. Martinez walked him into a left hook. Look at the rematch. Look at Martinez's feet. Look how he never changes his feet in the moments before the knockout. He knew he was going to throw that left hook. He knew the pattern. He saw Williams starting the pattern. He just had to execute on it. Floyd Mayweather knew Ricky Hatton, like Pacquiao and like Williams, was too aggressive and was open to check left hooks on his way in, just like Williams was. That's how Floyd ended the fight, right? These aren't accidents or luck. They are thought-out executions by counterpunchers. So... How do you beat a counterpuncher? Let me offer what I believe are a few ways. The first is by ambush. Right? Understand, we're talking about going from zero to 60. Right? The goal here is to hide the pattern. Right? In fact, you're trying to hide everything. The worst thing you could do against a counterpuncher is to actually have him see your pattern in the ring. So you can't box with that. You have to start out by not throwing punches. Right? A counterpuncher can't counter what you're not throwing. A baffled counterpuncher will often not throw anything back because you're not showing them a pattern. Think David Hay versus counterpuncher Audley Harrison. Right? Understand there's a reason why David Hay is in there not doing much and why Audley Harrison is not doing anything in the early rounds. Right? The reason is David Hay doesn't want to show Audley Harrison his pattern. He's just fainting from the outside looking for an opening. 
so he can jump in and go from 0 to 60. Right? The point is this. You want to show nothing, it's nothing or everything. Right? So you want to show nothing, just like David Hay showed Audley Harrison, nothing. Right? There's no pattern. There's no polite boxing where the counterpunching opponent is thinking, okay, he's dipping his head when he throws these punches. Okay, he's slow to pull back that jab. Okay, when he throws a left hand, it's about this high. I can throw a right hand over it, but it has to be at this height. You don't want any polite boxing. In fact, if you're going up against a counterpuncher, you don't want any boxing at all until you jump in and until you throw everything in an ambush, right? You want to jump in after showing nothing. You want to jump in on an ambush. You want to throw everything. Too much for them to process. Too much for a counterpuncher to block all the punches, right? You want to jump in with everything so they're overwhelmed. So in David Hay versus Audley Harrison, Hay's away from Harrison. The two guys look at each other. The announcers are saying, wow, why isn't Harrison throwing anything? Well, two reasons. One, David Hay's not showing him anything to counter. Two, David Hay is very fast, very fast hands, right? Audley Harrison didn't want to become a lead puncher and try to trade with a very heavy-handed and very fast-handed David Hay. So the fight is the two guys looking at each other for minutes, not seconds, minutes. It's low volume. David Hay is not even going to politely spar with Audley Harrison, right? He's not there to answer the boos of the crowd. He's there to keep Audley puzzled by having nothing to counter. Then he's going to jump in at the first opportunity, the first time he sees he can land a punch. He's going to jump in with not jabs, but heavy artillery. That's what David Hay does. That fight is over, I believe, in the third round. Now, if you're not all in with an ambush, because that's high risk, right? You have to have the gifts that, let's say, someone like David Hay had. By the way, another great Hay ambush fight, Hay against Enzo Macarinelli. Right? The guys are outside looking at each other. David Hay faints. His faint is his jab. David Hay is fainting, hoping that you'll move something, create an opening so he could jump in. Once he jumps in, both guns are blazing. Now, if you're not the kind of guy who jumps in the deep end of the pool and goes all in, if you want to be more cautious and you're fighting a counterpuncher, then the way to do it is when you jump in, you throw pot shots, not Ray Leonard combinations, but single hard Sunday punches. There were two counter punchers in the Mayweather versus Robert Guerrero fight. But Mayweather decided he was going to be a lead puncher. There are moments in that fight where the two guys are looking at each other. And Mayweather gets off lead hard right hands. He's not wasting time with perfunctory jabs. He doesn't want to give Guerrero, a counterpuncher, an opportunity to figure out angles and patterns. So what Mayweather did is when the two guys get close, Mayweather throws one hard Sunday punch, a pot shot, and then leaves. There's nothing to counter. right? Mayweather moves around a lot in that fight. But he does so after dropping bombs, right? The accuracy was astounding. Look at the CompuBox numbers. The point is, with Mayweather, 
he throws a very high percentage of power punches, right? And Mayweather is savvy. So he throws power punches, then he gets out. What Mayweather's not going to do is just sit there and play chess with you the entire day because he doesn't want you figuring out his patterns. So against Guerrero, an excellent fighter, I'm telling you, the more you look at the Ghost's record, the more you'll realize he's been a champion in multiple weight classes and is a real candidate for Boxing's Hall of Fame. Right? Understand, he's not the first guy to look very bad against Floyd Mayweather. Right? But what Mayweather did in that fight was one-punch ambushes. Right? He's with Guerrero, jumps in, lead right hand, bang, on the button, he's gone. Nothing to counter. No pattern for Guerrero to figure out. But understand, to be Floyd Mayweather, you have to have foot speed to pull off the pot shot approach. Let me also point out, too, that oddly enough, it's counter punchers who know best how to beat other counter punchers because they know what the other counter punchers are looking for. Let's talk about another strategy. This one's going to be controversial. I know trainers probably don't recommend this, but it works in fights. I've seen it work. And that's to hide your hands. By that I mean keep your hands below your waist if you have the hand speed to pull it off. Right? Counter punchers are searching for your hands. They want to figure out your punch pattern. They want to see exactly what they can throw over right if they need to hit you how they're gonna do it throw it over your punches throw it under your punches they need to see your hands so they could figure out when you can fire something back if you keep your hands out of sight and keep in mind here again you need to have the hand speed and the balance to pull this off if you keep your hands out of sight, if you're able to drop your hands below your waist, keep your hands off at the side, and if you've mastered an ability to, from that position, throw punches straight on the button, then you're going to frustrate a counterpuncher because a counterpuncher won't be able to figure out the angle at which to block your punch. Right? That bomb you have, you know, that... Let's say you're a great straight left-handed thrower. That bomb you have, it's harder for a counterpuncher to block it when they don't know what angle you're throwing it from. When you're holding that punch at an odd angle that their sparring partners in training camp haven't been doing. So take a look at the Adonis Stevenson-Chad Dawson fight. Dawson is your textbook counter puncher. Stevenson is just dancing around. First of all, there's a height dynamic. Stevenson's shorter than Chad Dawson, so Dawson already has to look down to figure out the punch angles. I'm telling you in boxing, sometimes height's an advantage, sometimes a lack of height is an advantage. Right? Stevenson throws a great straight left hand. So what Stevenson does is he just kind of bounces around the ring. You don't know the angle from which he's going to throw his left hand. What Stevenson's not doing is keeping the hand in plain view all the time. He doesn't do that. Instead, what he does is he's bouncing around, and that hand's here, that hand's here, that hand's here, right? But he's quick with it, and it's straight. So Chad Dawson doesn't know the angle that the left hand's coming from. It hits him flush. It takes him out and takes his title. Right? Let me just point out, too. If you want to see guys hiding their hands, take a look at David Hay. Take a look at Roy Jones. Take a look at Carl Frotch. These guys often will have a right hand cocked. But all of these guys throw lethal left hands, all of them, lethal left hooks, all three guys, Hay, Jones, and Frosch, lethal left hooks. But yet that left hand is dangling. It's often down around their waist. 
You don't even see that left hand until it's up here, up on your temple. Right? By keeping the hand low, they're discombobulating a counterpuncher who knows when he's facing a David Hay, I have to worry about that left hand. So they see David Hay dangling it. They're looking down at the left. They also have to look up at the right. David Hay, of course, is outside, not even boxing you because he's a textbook ambush fighter, right? So you're sitting there waiting for the hurricane, right? You're sitting there knowing the bombs are going to start dropping. And you don't have the comfort of knowing that he has his left hand up here so you can see when he cocks it, right? So hiding your hands, I know it's not what... <laughs> It's not what traditional trainers teach, but again, don't trust this video. Go online and look at the films. Look at Hayes' left. Look at Roy Jones's left. Look at the Cobra, Carl Frotch's left hand. They're dangling the left hand. Dangling it. All three guys can take you out with left hooks. The other thing, too, that throws counterpunchers off. Because look at Eris Landy Lara against Austin Trout, right? He's figuring out spacing. So he's looking at Trout's feet. He's figuring out how far away Trout is from him. Look at Floyd Mayweather's eyes when he's fighting a guy. You're going to see Mayweather's over at the side of the ropes. You can't even tell which way he's looking because part of the time he's looking at the feet. Here's where you have to actually hide your feet. Again, you want to hide the pattern or change the pattern against a counterpuncher. So here's where you want to shuffle your feet. Guys like James DeGale will switch from having a left-handed stance, DeGale's a southpaw most of the time, to a right-handed stance. Andre Durrell, same thing. You want to faint with your feet. Look at David Hay. His style is perfectly geared toward beating counterpunchers. When you watch a David Hay fight, you're going to see many times where Hay doesn't even faint with his hands. He just bounces on his feet. He just moves a foot forward to just hint like he's going to come in. That throws a counterpuncher off. Right? Because Hay's fast as it is. So a counterpuncher doesn't know whether to counter the thing. What's I want you to look at the first John Pascal versus Bernard Hopkins fight. Keep in mind, Hopkins hits the canvas in that fight. Hopkins is a great defensive fighter. He hits the canvas in that fight. Pascal is a David Hay, Roy Jones type ambush fighter. Right? It takes counterpunchers a few rounds to figure out the angles, right? Bernard Hopkins against many an opponent, Jermaine Taylor, uh, Jean Pascal, took a few rounds in the first fights against both to figure out what was going on because the counterpuncher is trying to read you. Well, guess what? A round is a round. You want to take those rounds. How else do you think Jean Pascal beat Chad Dawson? Right? The point is, you want to come out, show nothing. Then you want to jump in, show everything. You want to flurry. You want to do what you want to do. You want to get back out. You want to make sure that at the end of the first, second, and third rounds, you're ahead on the scorecards. Right? The last thing you want to do is to leisurely walk in the park with a counterpuncher during the first three rounds. You're finished if Floyd Mayweather is up three rounds to none, right? And, of course, has figured out the angles at the start of the fourth round. So Mayweather's even better off at the start of the fourth round than he was the first round. You need to be like Zab Judah against Floyd Mayweather. Take those first three rounds. You need to be like Jean Pascal against Chad Dawson. 
take those early rounds. John Pascal the first time against Bernard Hopkins. Take those early rounds. Right? You know the counterpuncher is going to start slow. He's looking at angles. He's reading. You need to be illiterate those first three rounds if you're facing a counterpuncher. You need to see him. If you see any opening, you need to hop in. Flurry. Do something that's judge friendly. Even if it's just hitting the guy on arms and stuff. You know, Rocky Marciano, if you put your hands up, he hits you on your guard. You want to be the more active fighter. You want to smart, start fast. You want to take the early rounds, right? The counterpuncher will be looking for patterns. You should just be looking for openings. Another thing to think about with counterpunchers is to smother them. You saw how good Eris Landy Lara looked against Austin Trout. But yet he hit the canvas twice against Alfredo Angulo. I'm not saying Alfredo Angulo has great boxing skills, but what I am going to say is Alfredo Angulo got up on Lara's chest. You want to have the counterpuncher clinching or defending. You want to smother the counters. Right? That's the point. It doesn't work against everyone because Floyd Mayweather wants you to be up in his face trying to smother him. I take it guys like Victor Ortiz have just figured that out. But against some counterpunchers, against Eris Landy Lara, you need to eliminate the distance between you and him. Right? The last thing you want to do is to allow this guy to be bending at the waist, dodging your punches, looking good. You know, uh, posing in the ring, landing crisp, clean counters. You don't want a clean fight when you're fighting a clean counterpuncher. You need to muddy the waters by smothering them. Finally, let me say this. The final thing that, in my opinion, and it might be the most important thing, fighters have to think about in fighting counterpunchers is they need to change the pattern. If you come out and you look great early, are you listening George Groves when he fought Carl Froch? If you look great early, if your pattern works early, but you know you're in the ring with a very experienced, savvy, cagey champion who has gone 12 rounds, who has gotten up off the canvas to win championship level fights, then you need to change the pattern. After George Groves' first four rounds against Carl Froch, why didn't he win that fight? He should have been dancing for a few rounds. At that point, he was up in the fight. He's leading the fight, let's say, 3-1 after four rounds. He's the guy who has surpassed expectations by the widest amount. He's the guy who has knocked down Carl Frotch. Right? Keep in mind, one of those rounds is a 10-8 round. So at that point... The way I see it is Carl needs to catch up, right? George Groves doesn't need to catch up to Carl. Carl needs to catch up to George Groves. So at that point, if you have the skill set George Groves has, George Groves moves very well. I know you, <laughs> I know it's hard to tell from the Carl Froch fight, but Groves actually moves very well. Look at the James DeGale fight. At that point, why didn't George Groves get on his horse? Force Carl to come through his jab. Groves, by the way, has an excellent jab. Change the pattern. You know the first pattern you threw out worked. Why would you continue using that pattern against an adaptive, reactive fighter like Carl Frotch? Don't give Carl something he can figure out after showing him the same puzzle every round. You want to come out with that puzzle. It drops Carl. It gives you the lead. Then you want to switch to plan B. Dance around the ring. Show some ring generalship. Let the crowd know this is your fight. You're in control. It's being fought on your terms. Have Carl run into a jab. Showboat a little bit. Right? Ten seconds left in the round. Steal the round. 
right? Look at your corner, smile at your corner. You're trying to impress the judges. This is a performance. Then if Carl narrows the gap, at that point, after you've banked a few rounds and gotten out of harm's way against a very heavy-handed guy, right? Who, who wants to actually stay in front of Carl Frotch for 12 rounds? If I drop Carl early, don't I change the pattern? Take my foot off the gas when it's apparent that I'm not going to get the knockout. Shouldn't I take my foot off the gas, faint, change it up a bit? Right, I believe Groves drops Carl off a right hand. Why wasn't Groves showcasing that right hand, waving that right hand around as if he's going to throw it, knowing he's not going to throw it? Come back with jabs, dance, go around the ring, make the people know, I've knocked him down. I've won the early rounds. Now I'm winning the middle rounds. Right? Shouldn't he have been using that right hand as a decoy? After landing it and dropping Carl Frosch. Shouldn't he have been fainting more? Shouldn't he have been dancing more? Instead, what Groves did was Groves decided that plan A was so successful he was going to stay with plan A. This is a fluid sport. You keep showing the same playbook to Carl Frotch, and sooner or later, Carl Frotch is going to figure out what you're doing. Right? If you're in Zab Judah against Floyd Mayweather, starts that fight in spectacular form. I'm telling people he knocked down Floyd Mayweather. Look at the tape. Floyd's glove hits the canvas. Right? When Floyd starts to make adjustments, shouldn't Judah have made adjustments? Shouldn't he have danced around a little bit? Why would you give Floyd Mayweather a chance to figure out what you're doing and then not change the script? Now let's talk about Mayweather Guerrero. Mayweather hit Guerrero with several crisp lead right hands. Straight punches right down Main Street on the button. Hit Guerrero on the chin several times early. You know, later in that fight, Floyd was able to feint that right hand. Have Guerrero, who had been hit with it several times, think that it's still coming. This is just like a play action in the NFL, right? It's like if my running back's tearing you up, then why wouldn't I play action and fake like I'm handing it off to Adrian Peterson, have the defense come up to the line, and then throw it deep, vary the script. If you're in against a counterpuncher, you should assume that they're going to start cracking your code by the end of the third round. After those first three rounds, you need to switch to plan B. You need to alter the script at least for a few rounds. You could always get back to plan A. Right? George Groves could have gotten back to the strategy that worked at the beginning of the fight, let's say in the last third of the Carl Frotch fight. But by playing the same cards, that gives a counterpuncher an opportunity to crack your code, to figure out your pattern, and then to counter what you're doing. You got to be savvier than that. Well, anyway, that's how I see it. Counterpunching has a long tradition in boxing. I hope you uh, use this video as a resource. And I hope you also leave your comments to this video with your strategies on how to beat counterpunchers, right? And I'm talking about legal strategies. I don't want to hear about hitting below the waist at opportune times. Yes, I'm talking about you, Felix Trinidad against Vargas. I don't want to hear about that, right? I want to hear about legal ways that guys can beat counterpunchers because they're all over the sport. Many of them are wearing belts. Many of them are among the best in boxing. Thanks for stopping by.